Welcome everyone, glad you could make it. Um, as you can see up here, it's going to be uh, recorded. So if anyone has any issues, um, please let me know, but it will be available at the end of the, the webinar for everyone um, to be able to listen or if you weren't able to, um, to make it. But very delighted in a cold Canberra morning um, to be presenting another edition of our 2024 Sebra webinar series, or as they've become known or monitored, as Sebrinars. Uh, my name is Richard Kane, a Principal Director of the Innovation Research and Education Branch uh, here in DAF. And before we start with everything else, I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, Ngunnawal people for me as the traditional custodians of the lands we are meeting on. And I'd also like to recognise any other uh, people or families with connections to the lands of the ACT and the region. Also wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. And also extend that out to recognition of the traditional custodians of all other lands in which our staff and participants are gathered here today, as well as to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today's seminar. I did just mention just about, uh, just for those people late to join us, just make sure you mute your, your microphones and have your cameras off. At the very end of the presentation, um, there'll be an opportunity for any sort of questions um, to, to make. In the interim, you will see up the top that you've got the chat field, so you can plug in any sort of questions as you go along, um, and uh, Rui will be able to sort of get to that um, when we when we go through. Um, for any of those newcomers that uh, don't know, but should be aware, the Centre of Excellence for Biosecurity Risk Analysis, or SEBRA, is a long-standing biosecurity research initiative, plays a vital role in providing um, the Australian and New Zealand governments with expert biosecurity risk analysis and advice that helps inform a range of biosecurity risk management activities. Uh, we are very lucky today to be joined by Associate Professor, I think it's Ray, isn't it? Ray Zhao. Uh, apologies for the mispronunciation before, to discuss SEBRA leveraging existing scientific knowledge and expertise to develop an actuarial model for assessing the costs and risks of uh, rising from biofouling on inbound vessels. Uh, Ray uh, has a PhD in actuarial science at the University of Waterloo and is a fellow of the Society and an associate of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. Prior to joining the uni at Melbourne, she was assistant professor at the University of Manitoba for over five years. I can also see on my screen here, we've got uh, a director, Peter Wilson, uh, Wilkinson, sorry, who's um, a director here in DAF in the Marine and Aquatic Biosecurity area. He's actually just gonna start this uh, presentation with a brief um, overview, and then we'll throw to our main presenter. So uh, Peter, over to you, mate. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rich, and um, don't worry about uh, the surname slip up, that is the same slip up my wife used at our wedding. Um, so I just wanted to only mention a few quick things and um, really it's a bit of um, my experience of how I ended up working with Ray and I say working with, but actually it's just a, um, a passionate observer in the sideline. But about three years ago, I was sitting with a regulation impact statement in front of me asking how do we know this is going to work? How do we know our policies are going to work? How do we know our risk management advice is going to work? And really, how do we know this regulatory framework is going to deliver the outcomes we want? And it broke down to a couple of key questions. And it probably applies to a lot of what the department does, which is we can be fairly confident that if regulated entities do what the regulations are asking and what our policies are requiring, then it would manage the risk. But how do we really know they're gonna do it? Um, and that really boils down to this sort of incentives issue. So we were sitting there grappling with questions about how effective were our policies and our regulatory framework, how effective was it really gonna be? Then was the next part, which was, well, we've got these um, policies and advice and we think it's gonna be effective, but 
we have to deal with this issue of is it commensurate with the risk? So from a biofouling perspective, we're talking about biofouling and the risk of biofouling being present to some extent on every vessel that comes to Australia. And with tens of thousands of vessel entries and more than 99% of Australia's trade by volume being on ships, even small changes in policy can have a significant impact on the cost of trade. So trying to understand what, um, how do we determine what's a commensurate was, was extremely challenging. And it's not really until years down the line of engaging with the SEBRA team and learning about what Rui, what Ray does and all of the actuarial models that realise what efficient management of risk can be and how important understanding the actual price of risk is. So the opportunities through working with the team and with Ray's sort of revealed that actuarial models have this opportunity. They are an opportunity in front of us to not only just sort of change our rules to improve them, but to completely change the game and make us a much more um, modern and um, regulator, a mature regulator, and to really improve our use of science. So it's not just we continue to be science-based in our policies, but we move beyond that to, to using that science to help design rules and policies that deliver the outcomes that we want. And there's so much more that I could say, but any more detail I would get completely wrong. So that's the best time to hand over to Ray. And um, I hope you really enjoy her, um, what she has to offer. It's, uh, again, just a small component of all of the breadth of work that they have, um, that they do. So thanks, Rich, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me start with sharing my screen. Hope that it works. So that's all good. That's perfect. We can see that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, I would like to thank Andrew for inviting me to uh, present today. Um, what I'm going to share with you today is to, um, to see how actuaries would evaluate the cost of biosecurity risks. Well, I what what happened here? It just moved by itself. Um, so years ago, uh, when Susie Hester and Gary Solomon talked to me about biosecurity risk, the first question I had in mind is that, what do I have to do with biosecurity risk? Well, I hope that by end of today's uh, seminar, you would uh, see the link between actuaries and biosecurity risk and how actuaries can contribute to biosecurity risk management. So to start with uh, one of the questions that I got asked very often, what is the actuary? So an actuary is a professional using math, stats, economics. Oopsie. Uh, let me just try to uh, share one more time. So that's all good. Um, so the actuary is a professional using mass stats, economics, and financial. Ray, we screen. can't we can't see your screen. Oh, that's weird. Oh, I see. I know. So what yeah, I you might have to just try it again, Ray. Sometimes it does that. <laughs> Apologies. I'm not. Yep. There we go. Back up. Uh, okay. So is that good? Yep, thank you. Right. Um, so we use lots of math, that's economics and financial theories to study uncertain future events. And this is really what we call risks. And the typical tasks actuaries would take on include quantifying how likely certain events are to happen, like car accidents, natural disasters, estimating the financial costs of these uncertain events, developing solutions to manage the risks and ensure financial stability. Okay, um, so I'll give you a few minutes of Actuarial Science 101. It will be really helpful uh, for understanding what I talk about uh, later on. So the one of the key elements of risk 
um, from the actuarial perspective is uncertainty. Now, let's think about two scenarios. Uh, scenario one, you have one, let's say, animal disease outbreak that happens each year, like one outbreak a year, and costs us $1 million for sure. Okay. And scenario two, you have some years with multiple outbreaks, but some years nothing. But the average is still one per year, and each outbreak can cost us tens of thousands to billions of dollars. The average is still one million each. So you can see that scenario two has the average cost of one million dollars as well, right? Um, so the question here is, which scenario is more costly and why? Okay, so scenario one, it's everything certain, one million, one million for sure, right? Scenario two, average one million, but we do have a lot of uncertainty there. Well, to me, scenario two would definitely be a lot more costly because uncertainty is costly. Why is so? Um, well, actors typically work in the insurance industry. So I'm going to, uh, let's say I'm an insurer and I'm going to pay for this um, outbreak cost. What happens if I only prepare for the average cost? I only prepare for $1 million of the outbreak cost. Um, and the actual cost might be $4 million. But the consequence is that I will go bankrupt because there's insolvency, right? And that's the outcome any insurer would try to avoid. The solution they come up with for this kind of scenario is to set aside a big lump sum of money. That's what we call capital um, to provide a buffer for these kind of unexpected loss for insurers, they usually prepare for the like worst scenario, like a worst 1% scenario. But putting aside money comes with a cost because you could otherwise invest that money into some other uh, project which gives you a much higher return. Okay? So that's why uncertainty is costly. Um, and in insurance, we also think about, uh, well, who pays for the cost of risk? and how much. Usually it's the risk creators or, or policy holders would pay for the risks. And the, the insurance premiums are determined by the risk levels of, um, of the policy holder or the risk creator. Um, we would often ask the question, now how often does the insured event happen? What's the financial cost of each event? And then we magically come up with that insurance premium. <laughs> well, you will see how we come up with the insurance premium very soon. There. Okay, so that's just a very quick, um, qu a quick actuarial science 101. Now let's put on our actuary's hats and think about bar volume risk. Okay, I'll, you, I'll be using bar volume risk. Um, as um, the center of our study today, the center of the presentation today. So we have inbound vessels to Australia. Um, they can potentially bring in non-indigenous marine species and the establishment of these species um, may require us to take some responses like eradication or containment, right? Uh, there could be further environmental costs or health costs. So it's clear that this is a risk. It has uncertainty because we don't know when these incursions are going to happen, how often, how, how, how many of them are going to happen, and we don't know exactly how much they're going to cost us. So naturally, the question we need to ask, we, we need to answer in order to uh, really evaluate the cost of the risk is how often and how, uh, how likely are the incursions um, and how, what are the financial costs of each incursion. Okay. Um, and another question we need to answer here is, well, uh, who is the risk creator? Well, that's, that should be the vessel here, right? And uh, we can say that vessel operators are the risk creators. And the vessels coming into Australia, they would have different levels of bar volume risk. You can imagine a vessel with brand new anti file encoding would present minimum um, risk of bar volume. On the other hand, if you have a vessel uh, with anti file encoding at its end of life and minimum maintenance, well, it's likely to present a very high risk of bar volume, right? Um, so 
from my perspective or from the actuary's perspective, well, we should um, we should charge a higher price for those vessels with high risk and a lower price for um, those vessels with lower risk. So that, um, well, it's fairer in that way, right? Um, okay. So these are the like the first few questions that I had in mind when I looked at bar falling risks. And now let's look at how the current, uh, what the current practice of bar falling risk look like. The current bar security arrangement chart is $1,354 per arrival for commercial vessels. Um, so this charge is not used for any uh, cost of um, response cost of incursions. Uh, it's more for the I, if based on my understanding, that's more for administrative and monitoring expenses. Um, and the vessel operators are not liable for the cost of any incursions. And biofilm risk is managed centrally through regulations, agreements, practice, and surveillance. The resources are allocated uh, primarily based on a physical assessment of biofilm risks. So there are some challenges with the current mechanism. Um, here I list two. The first is that um, we have asymmetric information and misaligned interest. So the vessel operators are profit motivated and they hold private information relevant to our filing controls, but they probably don't want to tell the biosecurity agency. On the other hand, um, the biosecurity agency is motivated by national welfare. This misaligned interest means that the vessel operators may not always do what the agency want them to do, like take more uh, measures to reduce their biofilm risk, right? And the second uh, challenge is that currently, the current practice does not price um, the risk. So, that means the allocation of the biosecurity efforts may not be efficient in a financial sense. Okay. Our team, um, including Susie Hester, Susie probably not here today, and Gary, Gary Stoneham, have been promoting the idea of biosecurity risk insurance. And uh, in our 2021 report, uh, paper, we actually laid out the economic framing for such an insurance scheme. Um, so for biofiling risk, we would em envision the insurance to be mandatory for vessels arriving at Australian ports, and the insurance premiums will be used for covering response costs, including eradication and containment for any um, exotic species incursions, and will also be used for covering administrative and monitoring expenses. And the vessel operators, which are the risk creators, will pay a uh, premium based on their the risk levels of the vessel. So what's the benefit of um, such a insurance scheme? And here I list three benefits, uh, which actually come from the three components um, of, of implementing the insurance scheme. These are also the three components where actors can contribute. So the first component here is uh, quantifying the cost of biosecurity risk or pricing biosecurity risk. Here, when we say pricing, we mean we should uh, incorporate the cost of uncertainty into the price. And to do it, we really need to have a solid understanding of the science behind the biofiling risk. And combining the science with actuarial methods, we would be able to, um, to more accurately quantify the cost. And the price of biosecurity risk is not just useful for a insurance scheme. In fact, the pricing information would help us um, with optimizing the allocation of biosecurity resources more efficiently as well. Okay. And the second component of um, this insurance scheme would be determining charges for importers or vessel operators based on their risk levels. So whatever we charge them should reflect the cost of the risks presented by individual importers or vessel operators. Uh, by doing this, we would be incentivizing a better behavior because the lower risk they present 
uh, the less charge uh, they will get, right? So it is in their interest to reduce their buy volume risk. And the third component is to develop an insurance product for biosecurity risk. Um, in what well, this is not um, the focus um, of the rest of the talk, but that's kind of the foundation of the, the entire seminar. We laid out the insurance product insurance scheme in our previous report. So the actuaries can uh, help with designing the insurance product. We can think about what kind of coverage do we want to provide? Uh, should this insurance cover response costs for all um, all species, or we're just covering certain uh, species, a selection of species. Um, so that is where we, the actors can contribute with the designing of the product and also setting the premium accordingly. Having the insurance scheme in place would provide the biosecurity agency with a sustainable funding uh, to biosecurity efforts. Um, so we actually shift the funding responsibilities for biosecurity efforts to the risk creators, and we will be able to link uh, funds to the scale of biosecurity um, tasks. Okay. So for the rest of the presentation, I'll be focusing on quantifying the cost of biosecurity risk and determining charges um, of for individual importers and vessel operators. Okay. So how do actuaries or insurers price risks? Well, the idea is actually simple. Okay, um, if you go to buy insurance, your premium are um, is likely including three components: the expected loss, the risk load, and expense load. Well, often you would also have a, a profit margin on top of that. But since we're talking about bar volume risk, we're not aiming to make a profit here, so I dropped that part. So the expected loss, um, so if you look at expected loss risk load, that's really about the loss. That's um, the amount to be paid out in claims. A claims is uh, random. It can be zero. It can be a very large number, depending on what actually happens. And it's determined by frequency and severity of claims. Well, in the case of, uh, in the context of following risk insurance, the claims would simply be sum of response costs of all the incursions in a year because of bar filing. And the frequency and severity of claims simply mean the number of incursions uh, and also um, what's the cost of each incursion. And the risk load, that is the price of uncertainty. Um, so risk load is determined by the uncertainty surrounding the loss. It provides a buffer for unexpected events and variability in the loss. Um, well, the insurers would usually charge with risk load because they want to pre prepare themselves for those unexpected events, right? Expense load covers administrative and monitoring expenses. Okay. So in order to price um, the cost of biosecurity risk or by filing risk here, we need to understand what the loss look like, not just the, the average cost. We really need to know the distribution because we want to understand the uncertainty. Well, by filing risk itself is actually quite um, unique because it's actually quite different from the majority of the risks um, insurers manage. It's low frequency, high severity. That means it doesn't happen very often. The way it happens, the cost is large, right? So in this sense, it's actually similar with um, catastrophic risk, like a cyclone, right? Cyclone doesn't happen very often, but when it happens, the cost can be huge. Right? So with that similarity in mind, we um, adopted the modeling framework for catastrophic risk. So this framework has three uh, modules, hazard, consequence, and annual loss. In the hazard module, we have a set of scenarios. We should have a set of scenarios for uh, incursions. Each scenario should have information about invasive species, 
distribution of pest at detection, infestation location. And we also need to know what's the likelihood of each scenario, because in the end, we want to picture the distribution of the loss. Um, and for the consequence module, we need to understand what kind of response we're going to take for each scenario. Is that eradication or containment? And what's the cost of the response we take? And finally, we can bring these two modules, hazard consequence, into the annual loss module. But we still need another piece of information that is um, the frequency of incursions, how often these incursions would happen. Then we can have um, a complete picture of the total response costs, um, incorporating the, um, all the information that we gathered. As you can see on what well, this slide, like the incursion scenarios, likelihood of the incursion scenario frequency, these are really not my specialty. Um, I had no idea about what kind of scenario is more likely. So this is where the science um, really comes into place. We need the science um, to provide the input of uh, for this modeling framework. So we, we, what we did here, uh, without a solid understanding of the science, we resorted to some scientific report. Actually, uh, many of them were uh, sponsored or funded by the department. Um, and we looked at some uh, journal articles to find the information we need. So for the hazards module, we need a set of scenarios, in incursion scenarios. So we were able to find this report uh, by Crombie um, and his team back in 2008. They developed a set of 21 incursion scenarios. These scenarios uh, were developed for estimating eradication costs given uh, the incursion scenario variables and the target elimination success rate. Um, well, it's a very insightful report, very useful, very helpful for us but it didn't have everything we needed um, because we still need the likelihood of each incursion scenario. Right? Uh, and we also want to uh, have incorporate some of the port attributes that could be relevant to the establishment probability of a exotic species like water temperature, uh, man-made structures, but these are not considered um, in Crombie's report. So what we did is to expand they're set to a set of 31 incursion scenarios with additional port attributes. Then we constructed a survey to elicit expert judgments on the likelihood of incursion scenarios and also the technical feasibility of eradication. The reason we want um, the response on technical feasibility of eradication is because uh, we, we have that consequence module where we need to decide what kind of response will be taken, right? So we wanted to understand whether it's feasible to eradicate or not. And the survey responses were used to estimate two models. Um, the first model is the likelihood of the incursion scenario, and the second model is the technical feasibility of eradication. So the model input, um, the model input is the incursion variable, like including some information about species, distribution of the pest, and infestation location. So just to show you an example of the survey, um, so we present two scenarios side by side to the expert. So each scenario, we would have uh, species information and the distribution of the pest and the location of the infestation. Um, and we asked the expert to provide the relative, the assessment of relative likelihood of these two scenarios. And we also asked them if it's technically feasible to eradicate the pest in in say scenario A or scenario B. Okay. And for this survey, we only considered six ports. Um, really for the rest of the pricing task, we also only considered the six ports. And the survey was sent to uh, 36 participants. Um, from, uh, they uh, are from different uh, sectors, 
They could be scientists, government officials, private sector specialists. In the end, we received 18 valid responses, and we used these responses to create the two models. Uh, so first model is for the relative likelihood of incursion scenarios. Um, I have to admit here that because uh, we had a quite large number of variables um, in our scenario and the number of responses is not that large. So in the end, we identified um, only five significant variables. So some of the variables you might think that should be significant may not uh, come across. Uh, that's probably simply because of the size of the survey and the design of the survey. Okay, but we still think that the results are reasonable though. So here I present the odds ratio for the five variables. So what is the odds ratio? It really uh, tells you what's the ratio of likelihood of two different scenarios. Okay. So if we look at appearance dot obvious, okay, the odds ratio is about 1.94 really means the likelihood of a scenario with species appearance obvious is um, 1.94 times more than uh, the likelihood of a scenario with species appearance cryptic. Okay, So that's how you would understand this odds ratio. Um, so you could understand pattern random, that's, um, that's the distribution of the pest the pattern of the distribution of the pest is random compared to non-random. Yeah. Um, so when it's random, there's a likely, there's a higher chance of for that scenario. And interestingly, we found that there's no significant difference um, between the responses from different uh, experts. Well, this is the reason I say it's interest is it's actually in contrast to what you, we will see next the model for technical feasibility of eradication. Um, for technical feasibility of eradication, we, we identified four significant variables. Well, the most significant one is area, which is probably not surprising. So if you look at area very small, well, the baseline is area large. So area very small, uh, the feasibility of eradication is one, almost 110. Uh, times more than the feasibility of a scenario with infestation area large. Okay. Um, interestingly, the, there we've observed very significant variability in the survey responses from different experts. Um, so some experts would choose invisible for almost every single scenario we presented, while others may have a spread across um, invisible and visible for the, the different scenarios. And so this is really telling us there isn't a, I would say there's no consensus among the experts about whether it is feasible to uh, eradicate the pest or not. So whatever model we build here, there's likely a very high uncertainty behind it. Um, so we need to be very careful about it uh, when we if we are actually going to use the model and use it for the pricing. Okay, so that is the models we built, right? We have our scenarios, we've, um, we got the models for relative likelihood of the scenarios and technical feasibility of eradication. Now we can have a quick look at the consequence module. So the consequence module, we need to determine the response, right? So the decision is really coming out from uh, the model we built. If the model tells us it's uh, it's feasible to eradicate, here we will choose eradication as our measure, our response. And if the model says uh, not feasible, then we would go with contaminant. Accordingly, we will come. We will determine the cost. So for eradication cost, we set it to the median cost necessary to achieve a 95% probability of eradication based on the estimated model built by um, the Crombie 2008 report. And for containment, um, we took a very simplified uh, approach that is uh, that is proportional to the to the estimated um, cost containment cost 
by the Summerson 2013 report. Okay, so the proportion is by the number of arrivals at um, at the port. So now we have um, a lot of information, a lot of pieces we need for the hazard and uh, consequence module. One final thing we did here is to construct a larger set of scenarios because in the in the um, in the survey we only had thirty one scenarios. We couldn't provide a too many scenarios because you would ask experts to assess those scenarios. Impossible to give them thousand scenarios, right? Um, but in reality, we know that there are a lot more different scenarios that can happen. So we constructed a larger set of scenarios with the variables that uh, that are identified as significant in our modeling. So we had 960 scenarios, and for each scenario, we compute the likelihood of the scenario. And also we can we determine the eradication feasibility and um, then calculate the response cost accordingly. So that would give us uh, the everything we needed for the hazard and consequence module. And this is what um, the output from these two modules would look like. You have different scenarios uh, with different variables, and then you would have uh, the scenario likelihood, you have feasibility probability. So if the feasibility probability is greater than 0.5, we would say that, well, it's feasible to eradicate, then we go with the eradication cost. If the feasibility here, say, for example, like in scenario three, is very low, lower than 0 0.5, we would say, well, eradication is not feasible, so we go with containment cost. The last piece in that modeling framework, that's the total annual loss. And last piece of information we need is how frequent the incursions would happen. Again, we looked into some um, some research work. We found um, an average of 0.2 incursions of bar falling concern per year in Australia. In one of these papers, we used that assumption. And uh, since here we only consider six ports, so we scaled that frequency by the number of arrivals, so we obtained uh, 0.046 per year, um, incur 0.046 incursions per year for these six ports, so that's about once every 20 years really. And we can't just use the 0.04 per year, that doesn't make sense, right? Um, you can't have 0.4 uh, 0 0.04 arrival. Um, when you do the computation, we need to uh, we we actually need a distribution with the mean of 0 0.46. We use the Poisson distribution to account the uncertainty around um, the number of incursions. So that's our frequency of incursions. So by now we have all the information we have. Now let's look at what's the expected total annual loss. Um, what's the uncertainty around the loss? Well, the expected total annual loss, so you can understand as the average response costs for the incursions happening at these six ports every year, it's a, I would say it's a modest number, it's $316,000. But if you look at standard deviation of the loss, that's about $3 million. Uh, that's a much higher scale, right? The reason the expected loss is small because is because the incursion doesn't happen very often. Most years you get zero. And then when it actually happens, you get a large number. But on average, um, the annual cost is low. But because every year you have a very, uh, your situation could be very different. So the uncertainty measured by standard deviation could be very large. Um, Remember what we said at the very beginning in Actuarial Science 101, uncertainty is costly. So this DVA standard deviation would play actually play a very important role in the uh, price of the risk. Okay. We'll get to that at the very end. But before we get to that, let's think about, okay, th that what we just looked at is the total annual loss, right? So we're considering all the incursions happening at these six ports. So how are you going to uh, assign the cost to individual vessels, right? What's the contribution of individual vessels 
to the, the total annual loss? Well, we know that it's not possible or near impossible to attribute an incursion to an individual vessel, but we can still allocate the total loss based on the vessel's relative risk of biofouling. So how do we do that? We need, well, we need to assess the vessel's uh, biofouling risk. Again, we have to look into science. We look at some scientific report um, and we also obtained some of the reports from New Zealand MPI. So we used two methods here. The first method uh, was developed by uh, Barry and his team in 2015. So they built a relative risk model for biofouling using expert illustration. They found um, three types of uh, variables or predictors that are very important. That's environmental difference between the port of last call and port of arrival, bursting duration, and defiling coating age. Um, and we also obtained the model uh, and the, the reports from New Zealand MPI. That model was built for predicting um, craft risk management standard compliance based on in-water surveys. Um, so we used the probability of non-compliance as an indicator of uh, biofouling risk. Well, since their model was built for a different purpose, it's not, um, I'd say it's not 100% um, accurate probably for our purpose, 100% suit our purpose, but it's still a good indicator, we believe. And these two approaches, one uses expert illustration and one uses the evidence-based method could give us um, could give us different results uh, many in many cases that's what we're going to see very soon so we we were not very sure which one would give us a better assessment of the relative risk of vessel bar fouling right? uh, there we, we don't have anything to validate their results so we decided to average the relative risk estimates obtained from these two uh, approaches okay so here I picked a, first I picked a reference voyage or reference vessel that comes to Australia. So this reference vessel is a bulk carrier with the average cruising speed of 15.15 knots and defiling coating age of two years. And we assume that there's no um, environmental difference between the port of last call, port of arrivals and it stays at the port for one day. Well, we in for this reference voyage, we do need different, uh, all these informations that we need in order to compute the relative risk, use the models. And the reason we use simulated arrivals rather than the actual arrivals is because we uh, didn't have access to the, uh, the, the actual movement uh, of the vessels. So we only had the uh, summarized data of the vessel movement. So we decided to use the simulation to simulate a set of voyages. Um, that's somewhat similar. I'd say, I wouldn't say it's perfectly uh, the same, but similar to the actual arrivals. So when you see a relative risk greater than one, that means the simulated arrival has a greater bar volume risk than the reference arrival. Uh, if it's less than one, then that's smaller. So this scatter plot here on the left hand side um, is really to contrast the two different approaches. You can see that they can give you quite different results, um, although there is a significant uh, positive correlation, but the results can be different. And the right hand side is showing um, the histogram of the relative risk um, average from the two approaches. You can see that most of, for most of the um, arrivals, we have the relative risk less than, uh, we have the relative risk less than one, which means the bar volume risk of the arrival is um, is smaller, see, is smaller than um, the reference vessel. Okay, All right. So with everything in place, now we can finally compute the insurance premium. So the insurance premium here 
uh, is shown in the final column. So you can see that this is the final column, that's the insurance premium. And uh, the final row, um, the three rows above, above it are the three components in the insurance premium, expected loss, risk load, and management cost. So I put 1,354 as the management cost. That's the current um, current charge for commercial vessel. So we consider that as management cost and put into the insurance premium. Uh, if you look at the median column, you can see that the expected loss is only $50, around $50, while the risk load is uh, $1,214. So how did I come up with the risk load? So I set the risk load to 3% of the standard deviation of annual loss. Well, you can understand this uh, briefly as if you're going to put aside one standard deviation of the annual loss, okay, which would be uh, about $3 million, as we saw earlier, and the cost of holding um, the capital is um, $0.03 cents for $1 then you would come up with the cost of holding the capital or the cost of the uncertainty as $1,214. Um, this premium, you can see that the premium ranges from uh, $1,600 something to $3,400 something. So it's a wide range. It's, it's a somewhat relatively wide range. And most of the vessel premiums are under $2,800. And this set of premiums paid by all the vessels would be sufficient to cover response costs about 86.5% of the time. And well, it may seem high, but remember, um, the incursions is only happening once per 20 years, right? So most of, of the time you don't have any incursions, you don't, so you don't in, you don't have any response costs. That means the premium we're charging, well, um, this 86.5 is not really that high when you take um, the frequency of the incursions into account. If you want to achieve a higher uh, confidence of covering the response cost, for example, you want it to have to be sufficient 95% of the time, you would need a medium premium of $11,000 which is a lot higher than the median, which is sort of 2,600. And I also um, did uh, another risk load using 4% of the standard deviation, just to show you what the difference looks like. Now the median will become 1,600, uh, around 1,600 versus what we had 1,200 earlier. So when you increase your risk load slightly, 3% to 4%, would well, the premium can increase quite significantly. Um, so really that, that that is all the technical work that we have done uh, in this project. There are several key takeaways um, from the work we've done. The first is that we want to emphasize the advantages of a bar security risk insurance. Uh, it can incentivize the vessel operators or more general importers to adopt better behaviors, um, to behave in a way that uh, the biosecurity agency would like them to behave. And we shift the funding responsibility to risk creators. So now the risk creators pay for the cost, and this could provide a sustainable funding for biosecurity efforts. Um, despite all the um, Actuarial work, I have to say, scientific research is really fundamental for the pricing work we've done. Without them, well, we can't work our magic. We can't come up with any number, really. Um, although the average cost of biofiling risk is modest, as we saw, like the total annual loss is 300,000. That's, that's quite a small number, right? But the uncertainty is quite large. And we didn't even incorporate all the uncertainties we uh, we could uh, incorporate. There are lots of things we didn't incorporate. That's already giving us a quite high risk load and a high risk, high insurance premium. Um, and there are lots of questions we would like to uh, explore further. Um, and for example, well, the risk load 
that I calculated is based on 3% of standard deviation, right? But really, uh, what is an appropriate risk loading for the a biosecurity agency because commercial insurance insurers uh, and the government agencies they work very differently you may have very different risk appetite uh, different cost of holding cost of capital so what would be a uh, more appropriate uh, risk loading here and another question uh, we are looking forward to address very shortly in the near future is to use the pricing information to assist in the allocation of resources. So, for example, we could answer the question, what's the optimal amount of monitoring effort using the pricing framework? So remember, in our in our insurance premium, we had um, the uh, expense load, right? And then we have this uh, expected cost and the the, the risk loading. If we increase monitoring efforts, we would increase our expense load. But on the other hand, we might be able to decrease the expected loss and decrease the risk load. Why? Because when we increase monitoring effort, we might be able to discover um, some infestation earlier. So the likelihood of those uh, costly scenarios will be reduced. So overall, we might be able to reduce the cost, uh, the price of biofiling risk. So the pricing information can help us um, to find that sweet point. Um, and also, we could um, we could um, answer the question: What are the where, what are the sources of uncertainty, and how can we reduce these uncertainties? There's some uncertainties we can't really reduce because it's inherent, like. Uh, a incursion may happen this year or may not. That's something we can't control. But there are uncertainties, uh, like um, if it's feasible to eradicate, uh, which may be uh, a may be able to be reduced with more scientific research. So understanding what the sources of uncertainties are can help us strategically allocate efforts to reduce the price of risks. Okay, and. Before I open the questions, I want to extend my appreciation to really a lot of people, but I couldn't fit them all. Um, Susie, Gary, that's really my teammates. Um, and Peter uh, and his team has been really uh, helpful share, uh, offering, uh, sharing their insights, offering all the resources they could have for me. And Rupert for sharing his knowledge, Dan, Dan Kluzer from New Zealand MPI. Um, for sharing their New Zealand model and information he has. Um, so it would not have been possible without the um, the help of a lot of people, really. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you for your attention. Questions? Well done. Thank you, Ray. And I know while you've been doing that, I, I was going to give you the hurry up, but I can see that Peter and the team have been in there sort of addressing some of the questions. So. I might just, given the time, we might just go through a couple of quick ones, see if you've got any um, Thoughts on them, Ray. So I'll just start at the top. It was from uh, Nick Seekham. Uh, said biosecurity risk insurance is an interesting concept. I'm wondering how difficult it might be to actually define the risk creator who might pay a premium in the event of an incursion. They are often not known. Yeah. So the key here is really not to trace back to them. We don't need to trace back to them. So it's like when you go to buy a house insurance. Right, you are a new homeowner. You go to buy your house insurance. They will charge you a premium. So where does that premium come from? It's really coming from the characteristics of your house of the or the owner. So it's the same thing what we're trying to do here. We're not tracing uh, to any tracing the incursions to anyone. We're looking at the risk you currently present. Then we will charge you accordingly. And that's that's really the key. It is, and I think Justin's made a, a couple of comments on that, Justin McDonald, as well as um, Andrew Robinson, around a useful distinction between risk creators um, and risk actualizers. So just borrowing his terminology there. Ash Mooney, have you done any modelling around the price points where vessel operators or risk creators may decide to discontinue imports due to policy premium cost? How would a reduction of the pool of insured entities impact the policy costs? for remaining insured entities? Um, 
Okay, that's a really good question. And that's really when we look at how we should design the, the policy, the, the insurance policy, what do we want to cover? So currently, if you look at what we cover, that's just the response cost. Um, if we would actually put in the environmental cost, that number would be huge. And it actually defeats the purpose, right? We want them to come in, but we want them to come in with less risk. Um, so you don't want the insurance policy to be uh, extremely expensive. No one wants to come, but you want it to be um, like it, it, you want the price to be a substantial amount that could change their behavior. Um, and that's uh, actually what we're going to, we plan to do in the next step to do an experimental design to see implementing this insurance, how implementing this insurance could change um, the behavior of the importers and what's the benefit? Yeah. Yeah, look, some really good questions and robust conversations we go through. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to mention everyone due to the time, but I can see also um, Abraham Grau Cod has mentioned um, highlighting the importance of early detection that can be funded by the risk creators, but which in time will reduce response costs and thus the premium. So can go that full, full circle. Um, I, I just want to draw your attention to um, there's a bit of discussion around allocation of resources mm -hmm. and um, Bruce Christie there has said, you know, detection time will impact the spread before the detection and the likelihood of eradication. Yes. Can this model be used to reinforce the need to spend sufficient resources on surveillance, for example, in order to reduce the likelihood of the incursion occurring or to find it before it spreads too far? And I might leave that as the last one. Yes. And that's exactly what we were thinking about in our that future work section. Um, so we want to use the modeling work, maybe just to make a simple assumption to start with, uh, how much uh, more you put into uh, surveillance and how uh, then that would lead to how much decrease of um, um, the time you know, since uh, establishment to detection, then we would be able to actually um, quantify the um, the benefit of early detection. Perfect. And I normally try and keep it to time. So apologies, because I know we're getting lots of good questions and things that are coming through. But I can say that Peter has been in there and very diligently responding to a number of those queries. So thank you to everyone. It was a, a really good presentation. They're all good. But um, uh, Ray, that was excellent. And um, also thank you to everyone there. I think on that last slide there, you had all of the, the contributors. And I know, um, you know, it's always a team effort in those sorts of um, instances. So really, really good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for dialing in. Um, and, and for those that are getting ready for lunchtime, um, we, we might let you go. But just before you do, I just thought I'd forecast our next seminar. It'll be um, just after school holidays. It's going to be on Thursday, 25th of July. Uh, Dr. Kroger is going to present on a novel structured elicitation method for identifying the collective wisdom of an expert community. So that's Thursday, 25th of July. Invite will come out soon. But um, just thank you to everyone for uh, listening in today. Great questions. This will all be recorded so you can play it back or, or send it out to others afterwards. And thank you um, to, to Peter for his opening remarks as well as to Ray. Uh, really interesting and, and really great presentation.